Jonesy's jukebox on KLOS. It is five after 12 bells. It's very hot out. And my guest is Steve Winwood. Hello, Steve. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm good, mate. Warm enough. Yeah, I came on my bike again and <laughs> sweat was just pouring off me. That was ELO Showdown. And you've got a live album out. Yep. It's coming out. It's coming out. I think it's out. Is September 1st. Yeah, so is that tomorrow? Day after. Yeah. Friday. Or day after that? Friday. Friday. Yeah, Friday, that's it. My birthday's on a Sunday. Oh, good. Happy birthday. 62. Oh, uh, well. How old are you? You've got, you, you got some way to catch me up. I'm in my 70th year. You started out young, though, didn't you? I did start out quite young, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I... As they say in America, I didn't finish high school. Yeah. But of course, we don't, don't have high school, but you know what I mean. Yeah. What, what, what's it called in England? Well, it was... Sec, sec, secondary, secondary school. Secondary school. Yeah. 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 And then you're supposed... I think in those days, in the sort of early 60s, you could leave at age 15. Now yeah. it's six to change the law. It's 16. Yeah. So I left 15. Me too. And... and um, went straight on the road and never really had what they call a proper job. Yeah. Although I think, you know, what I do is definitely a proper job. Yeah. But at the time, when you're, when you're a teenager, it's just fun. Well, it is. Uh, um, it is. But, I mean, you know, I, I started, uh, uh, you know, I used to play with my dad when I was uh, sort of nine or ten. And I used to have to learn all these 30s and 40s Dance on, on, dance on a, tunes, you know, which on a which, cable. Well, and guitar. Yeah. I used to have, learn them on on piano, but mainly on guitar. And I mean, it's quite difficult stuff. Yeah. All those chords and all that. Stuff. So uh, you know, I used to uh, have to learn that. I mean, I, I came, I came into music, in fact, rock and roll. If in fact it is rock and roll that I play, I'm not quite sure whether it is or not. Yeah. But I came into music, you know, from not not just being um not just from a sort of rebellious point of view sure. but but it was it was sort of music for me okay you know i was i was in mu i went to music college as well uh I, I i was going to music college when i was 14 at the same time i was doing gigs um around birmingham and then i got kicked out of music college because in the early 60s they say um you know what kind of music do you like and you know i i, I said well i like Paul hindemith and igor stravinsky because that's what i was like but i also like fats domino yeah. and ray charles and they say well you can't you've either got to forget about fats domino yeah. and ray charles or leave so yeah. of course i said thank you very much because i was doing gigs around town yeah and and i left of course now you can you can take a degree in fat stop, I know, I think, probably. Yeah, it's all uh, it's yeah. all uh, encouraged. Anything rock and roll these days, mm -hmm. it's all encouraged by kids. But that was so, you know, 50s was a was, uh, big influence on you? 50s, yes. Um, you know, like Eddie Cochran? Yeah, I, I mean, I learned to play the guitar in the 50s. Um, but as I say, I... I I had to learn to play all these thirties and forties dance tunes, and then through because my dad played saxophone and clarinet, uh, but he also played double bass and and a, and and drums, I think, and um, and through that thirties and forties, I discovered jazz, and then then we used to listen to voice of america jazz hour which was broadcast to the service american services in germany and had some fantastic stuff we, we used to record it and um, i listened to a lot of jazz and then and then after that i discovered ray charles and then all and then also at the same time uh, skiffle was going on yeah which which is a very odd thing Ronnie really. Donegan. Lonnie Donegan. Well, I mean, it took me a long time to realise that actually Skiffle was, was, was a lot of. Uh, uh, I realised after I'd spent uh, quite a bit of time in Nashville that Skiffle was a lot of bluegrass mm -hmm. tunes played sort of badly. Yeah. By English youth. Yeah. You know. 
uh, and it, I mean, it was years after that, I, and I didn't quite understand what skiffle was. Yeah. Um, and that was going on, and of course there was great stuff coming from, uh, you know, early Elvis and Duane Eddy. Yeah. And uh, um, Jerry Lee Lewis. Uh, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, Little Richard. Chuck Berry. Yeah, Chuck Berry, all that stuff. Yeah. And then through that, I uh, I discovered I was discovering blues then. Like Jimmy Reed yeah. and and um, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker. So and then in the first band I was in, Spencer Davis yeah. Group, we we what we were trying to do was to to uh, um, do these covers because most people hadn't heard any of this stuff. It was only sort of enthusiasts yeah. that, that were, were listening right. to. It. So we thought that if we could play them and almost do covers and copy them, try and do them exactly as the people were, you know, we're listening to, were doing them. We could, we could pass it on to people. But yeah. of course, we found out very quickly we couldn't actually do it exactly like, yeah, like the original people were doing. Yeah, you know, it was never going to work. So we sort of had to develop our own, yeah, our own way of doing it. Yeah. Uh, did you? You didn't. Did you? You didn't sing much in uh, in uh, Spencer Davis, right? You, you sung "Keep on Running." Didn't, didn't he sing a bunch? No, no, no. I I did all the singing. You Spencer did all of it. Did did uh, I would say ninety yeah. percent of singing. And when you did "Keep on Running," which I remember as a kid, yeah, was a great song. Um, did, did how old was you then? You were like seventeen. Mm, yeah, sixteen. I think sixteen or seventeen. Incredible. I think sixteen. Yeah, what well, would that have been? Sixty-five, sixty-six. Yeah, yeah. I remember seeing that on uh, was it top of the pot? No, uh, Ready Steady Go. Did yeah, you? Ready Steady Go on the black and white TV. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Amazing though. But how did you? I mean, because a lot of people when they hear your voice, they don't associate you to a seventeen-year-old white dude. No, well, exactly. Well, you know, uh, uh, Ray, Ray Charles was a big influence because suddenly. You know, I'd grown up playing jazz and and listening to skiffle and you know and early rock rock from America and and jazz and then was just hearing a bit of blues and suddenly Ray Charles came along and he was someone who was m- mixing all that together yeah. and I thought, well, that's everything that I've ever even country stuff and you know. Um, uh, American songbook standards. He was doing, yeah. he was doing jazz. He's doing R and B. Even you know, what did I say? He's almost early rock and roll. Yeah. And so, so suddenly he was someone that was mixing all these things that I sort of knew a bit yeah. about. So of course I just tried to copy yeah. his phrasing, yeah. learn how he sang, and that's. Uh, and I suppose that that sort of stuck with me a bit. I mean, I'm st- could. Never quite mastered it, but I had a good try. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good try, mate, I'd say. Let's play uh, off, off your album that's coming out September 1st, Greatest Hits Live. We're going to play I'm a Man. Mm. We're here with Steve Winwood. You'll listen to Jonesy's Jukebox, KLOS. Before that was Humble Pie, 30 Days in the Old, and Steve Winwood live again, I'm a Man, Spencer Davis Group. And that is from... Your new double CD that's yep. coming out September first. Yep. And uh, so it's all re- it's recorded over a few years, right? It's recorded over um, the first album is recorded over the last couple of years in the in in America in the United States, and then the f- the second CD is recorded early with a with a different band, a bigger band. Um, I, I had. Uh, and I think most of that is done in in uh, in the UK. But what we try to do is, uh, you know, throughout the years I've been try I've been obviously doing these songs for for a long time now. And yeah. So we've tried to sort of reinvent them a bit, and you know maybe inject them with a bit with a few different elements. Maybe make it uh, that I'm a man there. Uh, there's a bit of sort of yeah. jazz in there, yeah. and then. We've been trying to change them up a bit. I mean, if for no other reason, just to keep ourselves interested. Interested, you know? yeah. And um, and I've never released a live album before, so I thought it would be a good idea to get all these live things and 
and uh, as many as I, as would fill up two CDs, yeah. I suppose, uh, just as a sort of document, so that it was, um, you know, because I thought we were reinventing some of these songs. Yeah. And I thought it would be nice to let people put it on record. Do you what, like touring what? still? Yeah, I mean, at one time, you know, it, it's definitely a, a, an in playing live is an inexact science, and that's why I used to at one time I used to only like work in the studio because that's a controlled environment. But um, the thing about playing live is, you know, you go to a different different place, different acoustics. You've got um, different, sometimes different equipment different people get giving you feedback and after, uh, and at some point I actually started to enjoy the challenge of that mm. uh, and in fact more and more now I enjoy the challenge of playing live because you know you you can fine tune things and realize you instantly know what is working and what isn't mm -hmm. because of the audience yeah. feedback and you can change things and so I sort of enjoy it's still not a perfect I mean you know, you can go to one place and everything can change. The people can, the, the band might play something a bit differently. Yeah. You know, it sounds different. So it's, yeah, it's good. And I do enjoy that aspect. I mean, I have to tailor it to, to my age a bit, you know. Sure. So, I mean, I can't do these, you know, five five month tours anymore. Yeah. I yeah. do about three or four weeks. Yeah. And that's that's enough. Yeah. If only you can get transported to each con, like, but through space, so you don't have to do the travelling. <laughs> well, actually, I, I I sleep rather well on the bus. In buses a, are great in a bunk. Yeah, bus, buses are great. You is. just sling your stuff on there. It you're is. ready to go. But the flying and all that the is flying and all that. Nightmare. That's right. Yeah. Nightmare. If only you could just what do they call it? Walk speed to the next concert. Walking, that's good. No, yeah. not no warp speed. Oh, warp speed. Not walking, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> Although, to me, that would be better than flying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's good, man. Uh, so when the... I don't keep going back. The Spencer Davis group, was that already formed before you joined? Yeah, well, what happened is my brother had a jazz band and they were all about... Uh, you know, he's at school, and he was he started up playing trad, Dixieland jazz, and then playing some other thing. And I must have been about he was seventeen, eighteen. I was about twelve, and they used to come around and rehearse at people's houses in turn. And when they come around to our house, I was there saying, you know, please let can I play with you? And you know, they were all seventeen. They all had girlfriends and they, they, you know, the last thing they wanted was a 12-year-old kid hanging around with them. But, you know, I played a bit and convinced, and I think they thought, well, you know, yeah, he can play, yeah. okay. So then they used to have to smuggle me into pubs and things to yeah. sit me behind a piano, before, yeah. you know, when I was in short trousers and that sort of thing. And um, so then we played at the university, Birmingham University, and there was a guy there called Spencer Davis. He was, and he was playing f sort of folk blues on a 12 string guitar. And there was a university jazz band there. And he, he heard us and then he, he, he said, look, what uh, can, he approached my brother and said, can you and your kid brother join me and this other drummer from the band and do some gigs together as just four of us? play some blues and that sort of thing. So we sort of said, yeah. Uh, and and had, you, had you been singing before that or was you just playing I was, instruments? I was playing instruments and I just started to sing. I think my voice had just broken. Yeah. You know, and I was, but I'd been try, practicing trying to sing like Ray Charles. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd been practicing and I, of course I was trying to play Ray Charles songs and, and things and... Um, uh, and yeah, I was just starting to sing. Yeah, that's crazy. How many singles did you have in Spencer Davis? What was the other ones? Um, well, we had somebody help me, and then uh, you mentioned keep on running. But but then the ones, the last two were the ones that people in in America know know the Spencer Davis group for, which was Give Me Some Loving. Yeah, and I'm a man. Yeah, those are the two that 
I think. Well, those, those were the last two, and those were the ones that we wrote. Mm. All the other ones were just covers of things we were... So how did we, you write? Did you write as a band, or did you did you split it all, or was it that songwriting... It yeah, pretty much it was it was a, a give me some loving was um, was was a jam, and then we um, I played it, an organ lick on it, and then I went home that night and wrote some lyrics yeah. for it and came and I think we were then in the studio the next day, and as and in those days you sort of if you had a if you had a single to make you did. Half an hour on on, yeah. on the one and half an hour on the B side. Yeah, that, that was it. You know, in and yeah. out for an hour, and that's what we did. The next day, I'd finished writing it the night before, writing the lyrics, and went in and and recorded that. Then uh, a producer called Jimmy Miller, who, who was who produced the Stones, after us, he came in and we 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 did we added some stuff for what we thought was the American market. So we added piano and some backing vocals and some percussion yeah. on it. Um, but it was all done on pretty basic uh, machinery, you know, I think yeah. four track yeah. something. And uh, yeah, and, uh, and those were the ones that that got me known in America. Yeah. Different way of rec- you were forced to make it good back then. You had to. You only had a couple of shots, right? Yeah. You can't fart about like you can now. No. That's good. It's good stuff. We're going to play Higher Love from the album. Comes out September first. Yeah. Well, this is this is another one we slightly reinvented, um, and it 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 starts with with a sort of uh, with an organ bit. Which, and we sort of put that in because it, it sort of. Well, I like to think it sort of surprises the audience because they don't know that right. high love is coming. Yeah, you're, you're playing the Hollywood Bowl on September thirteenth, mm-hmm. and a bunch of casinos. Well, not <laughs> and wineries. Oh, it's, sorry. It's a, it's a grown up circuit. I don't. <laughs> I don't think um, I, I, don't, I don't think sex pistols have gone down too well. The, uh, a winer is no, no, no. I don't think well, so. I don't well, know. someone well, would well, like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Jonesy's jukebox, KLOS with my guest Steve Winwood. Jonesy's jukebox, KLOS. That was Barnes Courtney, Golden Dandelions. Still some good music. Yeah, com- there is coming out. Yeah, there is. There is. Um, you just gotta just gotta look for it. Yeah. Amongst all and the there's uh, a there's a lot out there. Yeah. They don't get a lot of them don't get to see the light of day, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There mm-hmm. are some real really talented people. Because mainstream is not it's not talented, I don't think. A lot of it's just junk. You know, unfortunately that's the way of the world. Yeah. Uh but it's okay. You can still make a living mm-hmm. and, and do some good stuff. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Steve Winwood, Higher Love, live from your double CD. Yes. Yeah. When, when, where was that one recorded? It was in. I'm not sure where they, they were. They were. It's in America. We they were all recorded yeah. different places. So uh, so to put you on the spot. No. Well, I, I don't even know where it was. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we we record every show. Yeah. And um, pretty much. Uh, because you know technology allows that now. You used, used to have to have a big truck. Yeah. Now you just have a laptop. You yeah. know, and we can we record pretty much every show, and and we sort of troll through. We knew some shows, some performances were good, and we just picked them out. They were on on a mostly from 2016, 2015, on on tours around America. Yeah. Now that's that track. Hi, I love. We were talking. When we were playing them songs, yeah, that was. Do you think that was the most popular you what it was around the eighties with MTV and all that? Do you think that was like you got it stepped it up a bit? Well, I mean, it it was in terms of of you know of. Well, I'm not even sure whether it was in terms of popularity, but I think I sort of it it brought me into the mainstream. Uh, uh, 
uh, more then because obviously, you know, in the early days of, of traffic, I mean, those were, I mean, I, was, I still live on the legacy of traffic, really, mm. as much as I, I, I do on, on, on those songs from the 80s. I think, you know, sometimes I get accused of, of selling out to the pop uh, uh, world in the 80s. But, I mean, I, I do maintain that if you strip away the... Um, Production. The, the, the veneer of the production and look at the songs. I'm I'm doing the same thing I was trying to do with, with Traffic, which is combine, you know, Afro-Caribbean ma- uh, rhythms with, you know, Celtic melodies or whatever it is and mix up all these different sort of the same sort of thing I was doing with Traffic. Yeah. But I think Traffic is much, it's, it's much raw and, uh, and, but, and because of that, it tends to be much more, was much more of a niche sort of band, yeah. Not so, not so mainstream. So I suppose, you know, in the eighties, yes, I, I got a Grammy and all that sort of stuff, and you know, I was more in the in the sort of uh, an MTV was there, so it it just created a sort of world. Then I think slightly false world, I think, but but a few artists did it, like Peter Gabriel. Yeah, he was in on that same yeah. kind of vibe, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There were people that did you only that. you only get a few tra- train spotters who, who complain that you sold out. Most people don't care. Oh, is that right? Okay. I, I believe, yeah. <laughs> Good. So don't worry about it. I won't. Um, what are we doing? John Barleycorn. This was a traffic song. Hmm. Mm. Do you want to hear it, or do you want to keep talking? Uh, um. I'm happy to keep talking. I've heard it before. <laughs> so tell us something else then. Um, Put you on the spot. Well, okay. Well, well. I, but let's talk about John Barleycorn. Then. Okay. Well, what it, does that mean? I've heard well, that exactly. before. Is, okay. is it booze? Good question. Something to do with booze. It is something to do with with booze. I think. It, I mean, it, it's a it's a sort of a old thousand year old folk song, and. Uh, um, some people say if you sort of look it up on Wikipedia or something, it says that it's it's um, it it's an old story about what they call the passion of the corn. So the corn gets gets chopped and ground into stones to make bread, and then it it rises again as either bread or alcohol or beer or brandy or whatever it is. So the corn gets the own. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Let's let's hear it. Okay. Take it away, son. (laughs) 